Hey, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me again on another episode of Get Into It with Gila. I'm Gila Glassberg, registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor. And today I have Amy Barron. Hi, Amy. Hi, Gila. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Thanks for coming on. It's my biggest pleasure and my biggest honor to to just come on to different forums and to talk about this important topic that we're going to be discussing today. Yeah. So I'll just tell the listeners, I found you on Instagram. Your handle is I was supposed to have a baby and um, I want to hear all about it, but I just want to say that like, I was just so drawn to your page. Thankfully, I have never struggled with infertility or infant loss. Thank God, thank God a million times, but I do have, thank God, I have a brother who lost a baby. Um, Sorry. Yeah. When the baby was like three months old. So it's just like, it's so like, yeah, it's so near and dear to my heart. And just like, you hear so many stories about infertility and it's a, it's real. It's like a real, like, and, and people just need support and to know that they're not alone. So if you can, I know I just went on and on about that, but if you can just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, thank you. Um, you didn't go on and on, and I, I, I mean, I. It's funny because I people, I, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about the work and the page, but I, you know, this topic, this general topic of infertility, pregnancy loss, infant loss, is so vast and so wide, and in our community is really just coming into the fore and just starting to be discussed, like. I always say like, you can never talk too much about this. Like the, the, the little bit that each of us do just help the people who are suffering feel so much less alone. So, I mean, you know, before Corona, when all of us were having multiple Shabbos guests, like my work used to come up at every single table wow. and we talked about it at the table. And mm -hmm. so I, I personally always feel there, there's never too much that anyone can talk about it. So please. Um, so I'm Amy. I'm Amy Barron. I am a physician. I'm a doctor by training. I a pediatrician, and I, I come to this work because I personally suffered um, with secondary infertility, um, and also had unfortunately six miscarriages, um, two of which were in the first trimester, and then I had four um, second trimester losses in a row. Um, and look, Baruch Hashem, Kenai Nahara, I have five children. So I, I, I think specifically in the Jewish community, like if people don't know me and don't know my story, you just take a look at my smiling, happy family. You know, if you happen to run into us, if we're, you know, going to, uh, I don't know, apple picking, or if we're on vacation, or you happen to run into a picture on my personal Instagram or social media pages, and you see a happy, smiling family with Kanai Nahara, five children, and you think, wow, that's so amazing. Mm -hmm. but, but the reality is, is that these, these stories and these experiences that I had and that people had have or had um, are so deep and they're so painful. And we as a community, we're really just not doing a good job addressing all of those needs and the people who are, who are suffering. And I, I think, you know, my, my specific, the way I came into this is that um, after my youngest, my youngest are twins um, and they're, they're now seven. They actually just turned seven, thank God. Um, when they were two and I had, after I, I knew that I wanted to take time off and spend time with them as they were growing up because they came on the heels of all of those second trimester losses. Um, and when, I started to think about going back to work. I was asked to speak publicly in my community. I live in Riverdale and to talk about my experience with loss. So this was five years ago. And like, if we all think back to five years ago, what was happening then was that the general public, not the Jewish public, but the general public was starting to talk about infertility. You would every now and then see a celebrity talk about her story, or you would see some you know, article in a newspaper or a TV show would feature that as one of their storylines or a movie or something like that. But it wasn't being really discussed in the Jewish circles and especially in the from circles. 
Um, and I think what I was, oh, I was on social media and on Instagram personally before, like I've been on Instagram probably since its inception, almost like maybe five years ago, seven years ago, whatever it was. And what I saw was that there were these emerging accounts, like one after the other. And then there would be dozens and hundreds of accounts that were talking about infertility and people's personal stories or talking about miscarriage, pregnancy loss, infant loss, but nobody was doing it from a Jewish perspective. Like all the Jewish organizations, and there are many fertility mm -hmm. organizations and they all do incredible work. They just weren't talking about it on social media. What they were doing instead was that they were just pitching their programming or they were, you know, doing fundraising campaigns, but they weren't being supportive to the community. And seeing that it was done so well in so many other ways and so for so many other communities, I just like, and, and being a person who is in tune with social media and understands how it works, I, it immediately struck me that we were just dealing with a real hole in what the community could offer everyone who was suffering because the piece that's unusual, even more unusual about the Jewish community, and I will say even more so the from community, is that we don't talk about things that are private. And, and infertility and loss often sort of falls in that bucket. And people felt this intense shame and stigma and just really and, and didn't want to talk about it at all. But the beauty of social media is that you, you can like come on and mindlessly scroll. Like you can just, you can passively get the support without actively giving your story to anyone or making it public. You can create a dummy account and, you know, anonymously and just or and post and, and even use it in a way that people don't know who you are, but still share your story. So I I created I was supposed to have a baby um, last year in the spring of 2019. And I, I it, it's filling a need. It, it's mm -hmm. filling a void. And I'm just grateful to be able to have the strength to be able to do this. Wow. Um, wow. What a story. Um, okay. So first of all, I'm so sorry for your losses. Thank you. I can't even imagine. And yeah. um, I watched a few of your lives and although it, I didn't personally lose a baby, thank God, I felt a tremendous amount of support and almost like that, that time period was so hard for my family. So it was like, for me, like the sister, the aunt, like it helped. So I can't, you are just helping so many people with this. Thank you. This Look, and, and that's, I, I, you know, that's another aspect of this, right? Like the, when, when we think about infertility or think about loss, you think that it's just happening to the couple. Like it's mm -hmm. just those two people, or, you know, if you're single or whatever it is, like, it's just happening to that person. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is that when someone's going through something and especially something like this, it's happening to everyone around them and everyone in their circle and everyone is suffering and doesn't want to see that person in pain. And everyone wants to know what to do to help. Like it's happening to everyone. So you're exactly right. Like this, this account, this nonprofit that I run is meant to not only support the people who are actually going through it, but it's also meant for people like you and anyone else who is, is know someone, because we all know someone, we mm -hmm. all know someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have so many questions. So, um, so first of all, the, so what is the goal? I know the goal is to, to provide support, but what else is the goal of the page? So the goal of the the goal of the page, the goal of the nonprofit, is basically threefold. Um, one is support, like it's support here, there, and everywhere. It's mm -hmm. on the page itself, you know, whether that's um, offering virtual support virtual support groups or one on one personalized sessions. It's the posts and the content that goes up where people share their stories or share their feelings or 
I'm pulling from other accounts and other people that are doing incredible work in this field and something hits them and, and they, they share an aspect of this that really resonates with people. So it, it's, it's support first and foremost, it's support. Um, the, the second aspect is, um, is really knowledge and, and power, knowledge, power, education. It's, it's the giving the rest of the community the tools to be able to support, exactly as I was saying before, to be able to support the people in their lives that are suffering. But in addition to that, it's also for the individuals who aren't yet at that point in their lives and want to, or are thinking like, hey, like, you know, I only get my period every, you know, three months or every four months. And I don't know if that's normal or not, but like, it doesn't matter because I'm not married or I'm not trying to get pregnant now, but like letting, giving pieces of education and advocacy to people to have them know, like, these things are typical and these things are not typical. And if this is something that's happening to you, then maybe you should go to your doctor and try to get it checked out now before you're in that stage, you're in that Parsha of where you're trying. Um, so the second piece is really knowledge and advocacy. And, you know, the third piece is collaboration. Um, one of the main thrusts, the main missions of I Was Supposed to Have a Baby is to be this umbrella organization for anyone in the Jewish fertility community. So I have collaborated with and spoken about as many different Jewish fertility organizations that are out there that want to be publicized. Um, it's, it's funny, like, because you would think like, who wouldn't want like free publicity? Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that sometimes people, sometimes certain organizations are very localized and lo local geographically or very, um, they have a very small um, target audience and they only have a certain number of staff and certain amount of funding. And they, they actually don't want their organization sort of advertised to the world because they can't handle it. They can't right. handle the volume. Um, so whoever wants, um, my goal is to be the place where people come to get the online support that you can sit in your room, in your bed and cry and still get the support. But then when you actually need to figure out which doctor to go to or need to schedule this test or need funding for a certain treatment, like you'll then go and find the organizations because you know, you know about them because I've already talked about them. So it, it's the collaboration, cooperation um, in the Jewish fertility space. That's the third piece. So it's really like a one-stop shop. Like if somebody is struggling, somebody has a family member struggling, any any of those things, they would go to your page. They would either get the support and the knowledge. Like I was just watching your your live with Bracha, and I Ambalapostas. yeah yeah and and I was thinking I was really thinking about it. Um, just for my listeners to know, I try not to I try to research the person I'm interviewing to an extent because I want to I like the organic conversation, so I don't want to like hear the whole thing. You know, you're incredible. Yeah, yeah but. Um, I loved what she was saying about like never ever asking or saying that somebody is pregnant, even though it's such a, it seems like such a sensitivity, but there's so many stories. There's too many stories. So many. So many. And, um, and I was like, that is really educational. Like anyone who's watching that is going to think twice, even though I've slipped up. I we have. All have. Yeah. We, we yeah. all have. Yeah. We all have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, I, I I think, you know, look, the organization is young. It just started, you know, less, a little bit more than a year ago. So we have these lofty goals. We're hitting all of them. And we have many plans to build out even what's there already to build out with future programming and future collaborations. There are, there are many things in the works. So it's, we're young, but we are, the goal is, is to bring this, to uh, look, it should be that anyone who's struggling should be able to know where we are so that they can get the, get the support. That's the goal. God willing, but God willing, let me hold on. Let me just say one second, God willing, 
this organization will cease to exist because oh, no yeah. one will suffer anymore and everyone will have the children that they want and the time mm -hmm. that they want it and this will not need to happen. But until that happens, until Mashiach comes, if Hashem gives me the strength, I will continue to do this work. Wow. So I want to ask on the technical side, so you're a pediatrician by training. So just for, for a few minutes, I want to know, are you, did you have a love for kids? Did you have a love for medicine? I, my sister's a doctor and my brother-in-law's a doctor, lots of doctors in my family. So yep. I would love to hear that story. How that yeah. Um, I, I grew up always like really always knowing that I was going to be a pediatrician always from the time that I was very little, I, I should actually caveat and say that in my eighth grade yearbook, it says that I'm either going to be an actress or a pediatrician. So I, so like, or a doctor, I think. I'm similar, not sure. similar. Right. Very similar. Very similar. Um, I, I, I had, um, I had, I had a couple of roles in some of our school plays. So I think that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't remember actually if it said pediatrician or doctor, but I, I definitely knew that it was going to be a doctor and I was going to be a doctor and that, um, I, 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 I always had a love for children. And I think the, um, the, the piece about pediatrics and medicine is that, it's a happy place in medicine. Like it, mm -hmm. there's so much of medicine that's depressing. Mm -hmm. And yes, is it difficult when children get these horrific diseases or cancer? Absolutely. But I wasn't going into pediatric hematology and oncology. Like mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to be a general pediatrician. And generally speaking, when kids get sick, they get better. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that was, I, I was always headed down that road. It was actually a gr great, like there was a really like really great moment in my medical school training. Like there was a point of time where when I was doing my OBGYN rotation, where I kept thinking like, oh, this is so fascinating because like you see the development of the babies and like you see how they grow and the embryology and the different stages. Like I was totally into it. And for a few weeks, I would say, I was like, yeah, maybe I should be an OBGYN instead of a pediatrician. And then like in, in these medical school rotations, like you do, um, you do some work sort of like th theoretically, like more in the books academically, and then you spend time on the floors. Um, and so it wasn't until a couple of weeks in when it was time for me actually to go to the labor and delivery floor and start attending deliveries. And at my first delivery, I remember this like like it happened yesterday. My first delivery, um, I you know we're there and like you know the mother's pushing and like the baby comes out and like it's like this like incredible awe inspiring moment, which all of us like like people you know you see it on movies and TV shows if you haven't experienced it yourself. But it's just like it's this incredible moment, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember being like, wow, this is amazing. And then like, you know, the doctor whisk takes the baby and puts the baby on the warmer. And I like follow the baby and like spent like 10, 15 minutes, like making sure the baby's okay and doing the Akbar scores and blah, blah, blah. And then like my, um, my attending, my, the person who was in charge of me at the time said, um, Hey, um, by the way, like the baby's not your patient. The mother is your patient. Like you need to come back here and like mm -hmm. figure out whether she needs to be stitched up. And like, mm -hmm. you know, like we need to take care of her, like not the baby. And I was like, mm -hmm. no, no, like I, I want to go back over there. <laughs> then I was like, okay, right. I'm actually want to be a pediatrician, not right. an OBYN. <laughs> right, right, right. Wow. That's so cute. That's such a cute yeah. story. I love that. So, so then you became a pediatrician and how long were you, how long did you practice? Um, so I did, um, I did my three years of residency, um, and I got married and had my first child during residency, um, and had her actually my, um, uh, my last year of residency, and then basically took about six months off afterwards to, finally spend time with her and study for my boards. Um, and then I worked for, let's see, one second. No one's asked me this in a while. So just give me a second here. No problem. Take I think time. it was like um, 2000 and da, da, da. Okay. So then I worked for about, it, it was either eight or nine years, something like that. 
um, where I was the um, was the attending uh, pediatrician in a hospital in New York City, where um, only for newborns. So basically, I did labor and delivery. So I was the doctor. If God forbid there was high risk delivery or meconium, something like that, or preemies. Um, so I was the pediatrician who attended the deliveries. Um, and then also I covered the newborn nursery and, um, and the NICU. So it sounds, was- it sounds like you got to do like that right. exact experience. Right. Over and over again. Right, right. And I did, and it was amazing. The, the truth was, is that it just, that in, at that time in my life, um, so I, it was shift work. It wasn't an office practice. It was mm-hmm. shift work and I could make my own schedule. And for you know, someone who was newly married with a baby at home and God willing, adding more children to our family, the intention was, I didn't want to be working full time. I wanted to be able to say like, I don't want to work on Shabbos, on Yantif, you know, it was flexible in the summer or whatever. Like I, I wanted it to be flexible. And so this was the job that enabled me to do that. But yes, you're hundred percent right. I got to experience the awesomeness of deliveries all the time. And it was incredible. Wow. So then, so when you were working as a pediatrician, you were also experiencing um, a lot, like that's when the miscarriages. Right. Right. So, so what happened was, um, so I had my daughter, then, um, then we had that period right after she was born, we had um, almost three and a half years between her and my son. So that was my period of secondary infertility, where, you know, I'm taking care of other people's babies all day long, and have one of my own at home, thank God, but still was unable to get pregnant. Um, We went through lots of different fertility treatments. We never got to IVF, but um, lots of different fertility treatments. That was when I had my first loss and a lot of medical complications afterwards. Um, But still, I continued to go back to work. It it wasn't, um, after I sort of healed from the complications, that it wasn't triggering for me to go back to work. It was like, this was a blip in, in the road it's bad and I'm really sad about it, but like, I'm like, that's just it. I already had a baby and like, everything's going to be fine. And I'm just going to go back to work. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did. And then from that point on Baruch Hashem, um, infertility, not my problem anymore. Um, So then we had my son, I had my daughter less than two years after that. So three kids. And then we thought like, okay, let's start trying for the fourth. Um, And, um, you know, thinking I, 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 you know, we're in the modern Orthodox community. I never thought that I was going to have 12 children, but we didn't Mm -hmm. think we were stopping at three. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, getting pregnant, not my problem. Got all the way up to 16 weeks and inexplicably, you know, went in for my regular checkup and there was no heartbeat. Um, And that happened exactly in the same way for uh, three more times in a row. Um, either at 16 or 17 weeks. Um, And we basically, look, I I mean, you hit on it exactly right. Like the question was, how did I go back to work and take care of other people's babies Mm -hmm. when I was struggling to have my own? Mm -hmm. And so look, a 16 week loss for me, and again, I don't presuppose any of my experiences on other people, but for me, that 16 week loss was devastating. I I was a wreck. Um, Also, the baby was healthy. There was nothing wrong with the baby. And to think that like my body just failed and couldn't carry this baby, we we had no answers. And so that was also very difficult to try to grapple with. Um, And we, so I, I, I still knew, like, I went to medical school. I I was a pediatrician, like to just throw my job away just because it was hard for me to dig my way out was just really not something I was thinking about. So I took, I I don't remember the time, how much time, but I took enough time so that I felt like myself again, and then went back to work. Um, And those first few shifts were really hard. I remember like I, I was standing in the delivery room and like, almost lost it like Mm -hmm. multiple times. Like Mm -hmm. I I remember there were a bunch of times like after the second loss, 
because I did go back after the second loss also, after taking even more time off. Um, after the second loss, there were many times I had to walk out of rooms because I was sobbing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did go back and, you know, as we all know, like the more you do something, the easier it becomes. And so those first few shifts were hard, but then I kind of settled back into a routine. And again, like we also never got any answers. So it was just like the doctors kept saying, like, just keep trying. Like you have mm-hmm. three healthy kids, like I'm sure it'll be fine at some point. Wow. Um, but after the third loss, I stopped working. I, there was just, there was no way I was going back. It, I, I knew emotionally I couldn't handle it anymore. Um, and at that point we had started to do a lot of investigation and talk to different doctors all over the country. And, and it was logistically, it was impossible, but frankly, I, I was not in a place that I could have done that work anymore. Um, and so I stopped working. Did your colleagues know, like, I mean, I'm sure they saw that you were pregnant. So was it like, was, were they supportive or was it just like, really like, I don't want to say shameful. I'm just saying shameful because like, like just from my own, like personal, like the losses in my, in my family, I remember feeling a lot of shame. Like we were talking about before stigma, maybe like pity, like didn't want to be pitied. Like, was there a lot of that? Um, you know, there were, there were only a few people that I told, there were only a few people that I was close with when I was working. Um, So obviously I had to tell my bosses and they were super supportive. And again, like I, my schedule, I was working per diem. So I basically told them when I was available. So it wasn't as if I had this regular schedule and they had to slot other people in. They were more slotting me in when I wanted to work. Mm -hmm. So they were super supportive and it just meant like that they had one less person that they could reach to when they, they had holes to fill in the schedule. Um, my, th- there was one nurse that I was very, very, very close to, and she was incredible and super supportive um, and, and really lovely and, and really like it was shift work. So I could never depend that she was going to be on the days that I was on. But when she was there, it just felt like I was, I was working with a hug. Like Mm -hmm. the whole shift just felt better. Um, the rest of my colleagues, my, the other physicians, all of the attendings in the NICU and, and the other OBGYNs, like they didn't know, I didn't share it. Um, it wasn't really relevant to what I was going through. And so, I, I, I stepped out when I needed to and like pretended when I, that I needed to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I didn't, I didn't feel like I wanted people pitying me and I just Mm -hmm. wanted to be able, it was also like, I was at work. Like I wanted to be able to focus and sort of get the job done as opposed to thinking that like people thinking that I was not competent to do my job. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the way it happened. And did you feel like you were suffering like in silence? Like at that point, were you sharing your story with like your community or? No, no. Again, like, so let's just go back in time. The the bulk of my losses happened between eight and 11 years ago. Not the first Mm -hmm. loss, but those four losses. That was a time both in the general world and, and also in the Jewish world where people weren't talking about this. So- did my close friends know? Yes. Um, you know, obviously my entire family. And, and also like there were other pe- random people in the community, especially that first loss. Look, I was 16 weeks. Right. I was fully out there. We had already, t- like we didn't put an announcement out, but mm-hmm. everybody knew I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. And then we had to tell people I was not pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was horrible. It was horrible. So, and then the next pregnancy also, like, because people said it was a fluke, like we didn't, again, we didn't announce, but people saw I was pregnant. Like I look pregnant when I'm pregnant. Um, I'm not one of those people that carries small. Like I just, I look pregnant when I'm pregnant. Um, But for the other, the last two pregnancies that we lost, I didn't share with anyone that we were Mm -hmm. pregnant because it was just, it was, I barely left the house. Like, let's just like call it what it is. Right. Like I, it was, I could barely admit it to myself, let alone to tell other people. Like I was sure 
that those pregnancies weren't going to be to end in a healthy baby. Like I was certain I was going to lose them also. I mean, obviously I was hoping that that wasn't going to happen, but I was so scared. So, right. yeah. So when you, uh, I'm just going back to the beginning of the interview, when you yeah. were talking about putting this page because nobody was talking about it. Right. Is that, was that in a way like filling that void for you, would have filled the void for you because you didn't have the support? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, my, I, I created this space for me, the me that I was eight right. to 12 years ago or whatever right. it was, not right. the me who I am now. I I've done my work, you know, my, my therapy and my, I've done the work on myself to get myself to where I am now, but the me who I was then I would have loved an anonymous space where I could just lie in my bed at three o'clock in the morning when I wasn't sleeping anyway, and just like pick up my phone and feel the love and feel like people really got it and knew what I was going through. I, I created it with that me in mind. Yeah, absolutely. So when you were going through all this, you, you didn't really have support or you didn't really have who to turn to? There was one person, there was one person um, who also had three second trimester losses at a similar time that I did. Like we would, like I would have a loss, she would have a loss. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we were, we were family friends. Um, and immediately, like when I had a loss and she had a loss, people put us in touch with each other. And she was the person that kept me sane. Wow. It was her and only her and she knows it. And we, if, if I didn't have her, there would have been no one. Wow. Yeah. So you created what you needed a few years ago in, with that exact experiential feeling of what somebody who's experiencing loss would need. Yes. Now, I, I really want to go there. Like, where does this shame and stigma come from? Like, what, or why is it so private in the firm community? Because I think it's important to, to know, like, we have to change that. Right. Um, look, I, I have many ideas. Um, I think, I think, I, I personally think that a lot of it is rooted in Shaduchim. Um, I, I think that that's where it's from. I, I think it's, there's a Shaduchim piece, and then there's the secrecy and privacy piece in terms of like everything that's Taras Hamishpacha sort of related. Like we don't tell people we're going to the mikvah. Mm -hmm. We don't tell people when we're counting. We don't tell people when we're trying. We don't tell people, like not that I'm saying that we should, I'm just right. saying there, there's, I, I'll deal with that part first and then the shidduch afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like like there, there is this, like we, we're given this like, don't talk about it. Don't talk mm -hmm. about it. Don't talk about like, don't talk about sex. Don't talk about, you know, don't talk about when you're trying. Don't talk about if you're not trying. Don't like, we, we don't talk about anything that's in regard to the bedroom in a, in a public way. And I think because look, look, let's, just, I mean, you could have sex anywhere and create a baby anywhere, but typically mm -hmm. it more typically happens in a bedroom. Right. So I'm just saying like, I, I think it, it sort of falls under this concept of, we don't talk about that. Um, the infertility piece, the loss piece, I, I think it's really rooted in, in a beautiful, like, we shouldn't talk about it because if we talk about it, it's going to bring more pain to the people who are suffering. We shouldn't talk about it with them. We shouldn't talk about it with the people in their families because if we talk about it, then it's going to remind them of their loss and then they're going to be even more upset than they are now. And we shouldn't talk about it. Let's just bury it and right. forget about it. And that, and, and let's just say bury it, right? Let's just say that that's an old school Correct. belief, right? About anything. Correct. So the more we talk about it, the more we cause pain, but that's really not. Correct. That's, more we that's talk about the it, way. the more we, we normalize and support, right? Exactly. Look, that that that's a very old school philosophy in right. general, and and we also there there's so much so much research out there in the general psychology community about how you know the more you sublimate, the more you push away negative feelings, the more you try to pretend that they don't exist, that it ends up like 
number one, coming out later in ways that you would never have expected. Two, it can affect your body both like physically and also psychologically. You can suffer with all sorts of ailments. Like there mm -hmm. are so many different detrimental effects that come from the secrecy and the shame and the not talking about things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's just so much healthier to, to, to really discuss things in a supportive way for people so that they don't have to suffer alone. Right. So I do think that some of it is rooted in that. And then I think the the other piece is, is I think in our community, it's also rooted in Shadokim. Like, oh, you know, they had a loss in their family. Oh, you know, they're going through infertility. And like, yes, obviously, like there are things that are genetic and like, I get that, but there are so many medical advances nowadays. Like just because you have a specific diagnosis doesn't mean that you're never going to have children or that you're never going to have healthy children. Um, and most Rabbanim in all communities are allowing, and I'm using most because they're still not all, but are allowing medical intervention for fertility treatments. We are a community that, you know, our, our main mandate is pru or vu. Like mm -hmm. I, the, the main mandate is to have children. And most Rabbanim, like really, they, they bend over backwards to do everything possible to enable couples to have it. So I, I think that that's slowly starting to change, but, but that is a piece of it, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So... I guess like maybe, maybe this is an opinion question, but like, I know that since Instagram has come to be and people are sharing more of their, their private life publicly, or maybe it's not private, but there is that balance. Like we do believe in, I wouldn't say secrecy. Maybe we do believe in secrecy, but that's like a false value. But let's say we believe in, um, like, uh, what is it? Like, you know, we learn in seminary all the time that you're not like, imp you're not impure, you're your um like separation is purity or something right like yeah. we get yeah. that message yeah. a lot yeah. so so there is like that underlying message that like almost like the more secret you are the more tenacious you are but right. I think it's just totally. misconstrued yeah. in a lot of ways so where where is the line that we want to share and support yeah look look there there is I I'm not I'm a person I'm 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 personally I mean sneeze in my own life I I'm not both in the way I dress and, you know, in, in the manner in which I go about, I wouldn't say I'm, I, I'm the model for this, but it, it's definitely a value that I hold in one that I think that is important. Um, where's the line? I think the line is that when we're, we're not, if, if, if there are people who are in pain in our community and we, we, as, we are not doing a good job at reaching them and they're feeling isolated and alone and then can have so many other detrimental effects in terms of their own mental health, which can then spill over to their families and their children mm -hmm. and then the community at large, then where do those values lie? Like, like then we, we all have to like take a look and say, like, what are we really doing here? Right. I, I think, I think, you know, what I always say is that the Jewish community and specifically the from community, I always believe is, is, is about five years or so behind the general public. Mm -hmm. Like everybody else was talking about cancer years before we started talking about cancer. Mm -hmm. Everybody else was talking about mental illness years before we started talking about mental illness, right? And like, I could give you a thousand topics like that. You know this as well, right? right. right? So I think that slowly, 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 we're realizing that yes, there obviously is a value in privacy and in SNES and, and making sure that people are given the space that the private space they need to be able to handle and grieve and do whatever they need. But there also is a communal need to support them. Mm -hmm, definitely, 100%. I think the, like the visual that came to my mind when you were saying that the firm world is five years behind is like almost like dipping your toes in the water. Like they're like the, uh, the community at large is like, should we talk about this? Let's try. Let's see. And then it's just like, right. Oh, it's like, exactly. Oh, mental illness. Yeah. We all have mental illness in our family, grief, yeah. loss. Yeah. Infertility, like, like, and then it's like 
there's just this like outpouring of support, like all these organizations and yeah, I guess, I guess I wasn't trying to challenge you. I was just trying to, I always love to like, I I didn't, I didn't take it that way at all. I I love, I love these conversations. I I love them. Yeah, I think that's how we get like clarity on, like I was thinking about, um, let's say like we talked a little bit before the interview. So my my mother passed away very suddenly about two years ago and I I write about it, I blog about it. And and sometimes I would even um, write about like my anger towards Hashem, my questioning of Hashem. And I, I, was, I was feeling a lot of mm, guilt, shame or like the shame vulnerability piece, like am I oversharing? And, um, I am in the very from Orthodox community, you know, so there is like a little bit of like, I'm pushing the envelope, but I got so much, uh, feedback, like, thank you for talking about that. And I, I, I am definitely a questioner. That's just my personality. And I, I was thinking about a Rav who I was close with before I got married, Rav Milstein. I remember him giving a share saying, we, we don't have blind faith. That's not Judaism we are supposed to like question and turn and the whole Gemara is about questioning. And I, I went back to that, that person, that, that topic in my brain. And I was like, guys, this is real. Like you suffer a loss. Hashem's pushing you. Of course you're questioning. That's, that's part of it. And like, we do have to talk about it. We can't just be like, like, I, I always have this joke with my friends and I hope I'm not offending anyone on this podcast, but I always have this joke with my friends. Like, Hi, how are you? I'm good. Bar Hashem. My house is a mess and I'm crying in the bathroom. Bar Hashem. Bar Hashem. I'm like, you don't have to say Bar Hashem that you're crying in the bathroom. Like, come on guys. Like, let's get real, you know? Right. Exactly. Look, I I think that, um, you know, we, we as humans, have the capacity to have complicated emotions and we have the capacity to sit with grief and sadness and pain. And I, th- I think that some of it, you know, it, it, it oh, oh, you know, obviously it comes from a good place, right? It's this like, Hashem is testing me. Hashem like is giving me this specific, like this test because he knows that I'll be able to surmount it. And, you know, I, 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 I Hashem loves me. and like, it's all for the good and Baruch Hashem, everything's fine. And like, yeah, okay. And if that works for you, great. Like kol hakavod, let it work for you and l- let that piece be your driving. L- let that piece be your drive, the piece that drives you. But for the rest of us who aren't on that lofty level, who are, who are just in pain, like it's really hard to just say like, okay, Hashem, I know you're testing me and like, I, I'm I'm here and it's fine. Just just keep throwing the bad stuff at me. Like I know I know you're doing it because you know you love me. Like it, it's just it's just really hard to get to that place. Like you know, people and I I think people are so well meaning. I, like I remember like after one of my losses, like someone gave me this incredible book called The Garden of Amuna, right? And like we all know about this book, like. I mean, I don't know about everyone, but mm-hmm. you know, it, it's a very popular book because it's mm-hmm. basically, I mean, he has a series and I can't remember who the author is right now, but I mean, he has a series and he really talks about Amuna and Bitachon and how like really that, you know, y- you can in any sar or stress that comes in your life, like you can really look at it in a way that Hashem is trying to teach you a message and teach you a lesson, give you a message, whatever, like that, that, that you believe that from on high that he's really like giving this to you for the good. And, and I also, I remember like we, we all see like these different individuals who have gone through tremendous like struggle in their lives or like have like people have gone through the Holocaust or have gone through like terrible things and they come out with this like tremendous amuna and really um, just connect to Hashem in a much deeper level. And that's wonderful. But the rest of us are just really in pain and can't necessarily at that time access those emotions and those feelings. It's just about like, this sucks. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hold a baby in my arms. I was supposed to hold a baby in my arms. And now... I'm going through my third IVF, my, or 
I was supposed to be four months pregnant and now I'm sitting here with a belly and an empty belly. Like, it's just really hard. And we also have, I, I think as a community, we, we have an obligation to meet people in their pain as well and not just give them the lofty religious and spiritual pieces. Like there's also pain and it needs to be dealt with. Yeah. Um, right. I wouldn't even, I, I, I've stopped using like, like that lofty level. Like I've stopped thinking about it that way. Cause I'm like, I just posted on my Instagram. Like if somebody seems to be doing it better than you, they either, um, I, I always say this, they either, um, have more help than you that you don't see have a different personality or they're totally. faking it. And totally. I just believe that like a lofty level, maybe Hashem just, you know, gave them a different Nikudas Havachira. Like they just, yes. I don't know, their mother had more Amuna. They, they have an easygoing personality. They have like for the people who, who are sensitive, highly sensitive or empaths or whatever. I, I think of the Enneagram, like, like yep. a really feeling person, like, that pain, like I, I know for myself when I was, I mean, I'm still struggling, obviously, but when I'm talking to my therapist about, I know what I could do to make myself feel better. Like I could look at pictures of my mom. I can meditate. I could call a sister, but what do I do when I'm in so much pain that I can't access the coping skills, you know, like, and like what you said, like this sucks, like, you know, like it's so, it's so powerful, even though like some people maybe would say like, don't stay there. Don't be stuck there. Like, right. no, I have to, I have right. to. So, right. so what is it that you like, I want, I want to give the listener something practical. What, what are some of the most powerful coping skills that you would recommend for people who are really in, in the trenches? I, I don't recommend actually any, anything personally because I, I, I can give, you know, grand overtures, mm -hmm. but for, for everybody, it's very, very deeply personal. Um, what works for me or what works for me is not going to work for you. Um, but what I, what I do talk about on the page a lot and, I, and, and in other spaces is that like really listening to yourself and like hearing, like taking your temperature, so to speak, and, and hearing where you're at. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not having a good day and you have the capacity to like take an hour off, take a half an hour off or take the whole day off and mm -hmm. spend the day in bed or or walking on the beach or getting a massage, what, whatever the, that thing is for you that's nourishing, if you have the ability to give it to yourself, then do it. Like it, I, I, you know, self-care, like I think people talk a lot about like this notion of like self-care is like, you know, manicures and chocolate, like mm -hmm. self-care is like the furthest from manicures and chocolate. Mm -hmm. Self-care is listening to yourself and knowing what you're capable of. Right. And then if you're not capable of X, Y, or Z, like, so, so the first self-care I always say is like saying no, mm -hmm. like you can say no because yeah. you're not up for it yeah. and that's okay. Right. But, but the other thing is, what are the things for you that help to nourish your soul, your neshama, your guf, your every part of your body? Like what, what is that thing for you? And for everybody, it's different. Like for me personally, when I was in the trenches and going through all of my losses and like on a day-to-day -day would like wake up and be like, I'm getting back into bed. Like there's no mm -hmm. purpose. Like mm -hmm. this is horrible. Like I could not see the light mm -hmm. for me. It was just about distraction, like anything that I could do to not fixate on my loss. So it was like every possible book I could get my hands on mm -hmm. every magazine, TV show, movie. It was just about like anything I could do to not think about it. And then when I was ready to get up out of bed and finally start like facing the world, and it wasn't even the world, but it was just start like coming back to myself a little bit, exercise was the thing that did it for me um, because I'm a person when I get pregnant, I gain one pound for every week of pregnancy. So I had 16 or 17 pounds plus on me for every mm -hmm. pregnancy that I lost and 
the fact that every single morning I would try to get on my clothes and they wouldn't fit was a daily reminder of everything that I had lost. And so losing the weight, but also the endorphins that I got once I got myself on my treadmill and the absolute like pounding of my feet Mm -hmm. against the treadmill or the pavement, or like when I used to go to the gym more and like lifting these really heavy weights, like that physical exertion of like getting out my anger and frustration was really, really therapeutic for me. Right, right. But everybody has to find their thing and then do it. Right. I love what you said. It's like permission, like permission to stay in bed, permission to watch TV, distraction. Um, I think that that's, I, I was thinking about like what I teach, which is intuitive eating, which is I always say that intuitive eating spills over into intuitive living and like the cues of your body, you know, am I hungry? Am I full? Am I sad? Am I happy? Am I, do I need distraction? Do I need exercise? Like that comes from, you know, like permission, permission to feel. And there, and like you said before, um, I'm going to start wrapping it up. I know you have to go, but like you said before, um, there's, I think I just lost my train of thought. Um, (laughs) <laughs> no, no, I, I was just going to say very quickly the permission, yes. like I'll just say it yeah, even permission. spills over even to my life right now. Like last night it was after, it was almost midnight and I still had like a half an hour, 45 minutes worth of work to get done. And I was hungry, but I wasn't actually really hungry. I really just wanted chocolate. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, it's not so healthy for me to be eating chocolate at midnight, but like, honestly, I kind of want some chocolate. Right. So I went and in my freezer, I always like babka is my thing. Mm. So like I went to my freezer and I found my stash of chocolate babka and I cut off a piece and I ate it at midnight last night because right. like, that's what I needed. Right. And right. Like, it's just like, that's like, you just have to listen to what your body needs. Right. And I think that what, so what you were saying before is that like, when we don't listen to what our body needs, when we don't let ourselves feel and Dr. Sarno, you know, Dr. Sarno healing back pain like that like, and I, I read such a good book, um, feel your fear and do it anyway. She gives really good examples of how unprocessed emotions, like almost hits you in the face when you're not ready for it. So like anyone who I heard, um, I heard Malky Hirsch on a podcast talking about losing her husband. And she said, like, one thing that somebody said to her was not to take, um, medication to go through the pain. Everybody will say something different. Right. I've heard, I've heard many different things about yeah, pain sure. and loss. Um, but but I, I was like, yeah, like I was thinking about all these things, like the only way to deal with grief is to go through it. And I think that what you're doing is letting people have permission to go through it and to feel, and by listening to other people's stories and, you know, like all the content that you're putting out and that's, that's how, that's like a part of healing that permission. God, God willing that that's, that's the hope. That's the hope, and and that people people feel people feel that they have the permission to feel, and they and that they also feel the hug at the same time. That's the hope. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. Where could we? Where could people find you? Um, the best place to find me is on Instagram. Um, I was supposed to have a baby, or we, or there's a website. I was supposed to have a baby. Org. Um, all we have lots and lots and lots of resources. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of highlights on different topics related to infertility or loss. Um, There are 50 plus um, Instagram lives that are on YouTube that people can watch different topics, different professionals, lay leaders, et cetera. Um, There's a lot of content out there. Go find it. It's there. And if there's something that you want me to address, if, if you feel that there's been a hole, if you just want to connect, if you want to tell your story, um, please come find me. I'm always open to people messaging me and I answer every single me- message personally. And I try to do it within the 24 hour period. Wow. And that, I'll just say like, that's an example of somebody like taking their pain and like using it to serve. It's incredible. Incredible. Like- everybody has the ability to do what they can. And I have, like, as you said, like the way you posted today, I didn't see it yet, but how, like, if someone's doing it better, it means that they have more help or they have more this or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. so I have the ability because 
I have help. I, 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 I make no, um, you know, I, I make no excuses for it. I, I have um, a cleaning lady who helps me to keep my house running. My husband is incredible and I can do this work completely free because his salary enables us to support the family. And so I don't have to bring in a salary and work as a pediatrician at the moment. So like it's, there are, there, Hashem has given me these opportunities for a reason. And I'm just trying to help as many people as possible. Incredible. Incredible. Okay. So I'm going to put all your information in the show notes so that everyone can find you and get the support they need. Great. Gila, thank you so much. I look, I, I've done a lot of interviews and, but I, I, this message is important and this, this work is important. And you, you brought out a number of different things that I haven't spoken about in a really long time and the pieces that are really important. And I, I love the way that you look, you, you come at this because you, you, you want to be able to bring these kinds of education, this kind of education to your community as well. And it's coming also from, from the loss of your mother, which I'm so sorry about, but I, I'm also just grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, you really, it it was just, it was so easy to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day.